Welcome to the latest installment of the Sharp Best Ball Show. I'm your host, Todd Burrows. You can find me on Twitter at Best Ball NFL. And I am joined today by Ryan McChrystal of Sharp Football Analysis and my buddy Shane Hallam of Draft Countdown. Guys, how are you today? Doing well. Doing great. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited to be here. Yep. So the purpose um, is last week uh, I talked a lot about different things, and one of them was the draft. And, you know, it was more of a, a talk with Theo about landing spots and how it affects veterans. Both of you have done extensive work on the rookies. I think both of you are absolutely brilliant and guys that I lean on for for your thoughts. And so I wrote an article this week where I went through every of the top 25 rookies in order of their ADP on underdog. And we're going to go through them. I'm going to get Ryan's thoughts, Shane's thoughts. And guys, you know, you obviously read what I wrote. So Feel free to say I agree with Todd on this or I don't dis- I disagree on that. Let's tie it all together. Let's get guys over to that article and let's help everyone to see where the value is or isn't on these rookies. I'm going to give the uh, the visiting player the chance to go first. That'll be Mr. Hallam. Um, Shane, B. John Robinson, uh, he went off the board at pick 1-7. Right now, that's his ADP. He went to Atlanta. He has very early first-round uh, draft capital. He's going between Fred Taylor and Austin Eckler. And lately, I've actually seen him go ahead of both of those guys. Uh, what are your thoughts on Bijan at that ADP? Well, I, I think it's interesting. I mean, we've seen running backs go in the top 10 of the NFL draft. They produced. We saw Saquon Barkley be the RB1 when he was a rookie. I think Bijan has equal talent. And we know that Falcon system is going to rely on the run, um, especially with the addition of his receiving ability. You know, I, I'm fine with it. I think, is he going to, you know, definitely be ahead of Jonathan Taylor and, you know, end up there? Maybe not. Uh, but I do think you might have more spike weeks from Bijan. I think he's going to have some big weeks and probably some down weeks. And I think in best ball, you know, that's ideally what you want. I, I love, I like taking them at the one hundred and seven. Great, Ryan. I wrote in my article that um, I, I think you have to at least be even weight on a guy like Bijan with his talent running behind what should be one of the best offensive lines in football. Uh, but that there is a better than uh, minimum chance that the head coach, Arthur Smith, once again, frustrates fantasy players. And, you know, Tyler Algier was very good in that system. I do have a fear that Tyler Algier is not going to completely go away. Um, and with the 1-7, I don't think you need him to go away completely, but you want him really in the background as a, you know, once in a while to give Bijan a rest, not a regular contributor. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. I think drafting him this high is aggressive, but at the same time, you certainly want to have exposure to him because the ceiling is, you know, through the roof. He could be, you know, even drafting him in the first round, he could be a league winner if he just has, you know, puts up huge numbers. He's that talented and he's going to have pass game production. So you want to have exposure to him. I, some of the concerns that I have with Robinson, first of all, is that he's not quite as explosive as I think maybe some casual fans might think because he does have big runs on highlights, but he was not really an explosive. It, he, there was no volume to his explosive plays. It was just some here and there. He gained 10 or more yards on only 16% of his carries last year. That was sort of towards the bottom of this draft class and contrast that to someone like Zach Charbonnet, who is, I think has the reputation of being more of a plotting runner, but Charbonnet's explosive run rate was 23%, a significant jump above Robinson. So that's a little bit of a concern. And then I'm also just a little hesitant as to how he transitions into the Falcons offense in terms of, we already know that he's not a top tier explosive runner, and he's going to be running into a ton of stacked boxes in that offense. Falcons running backs last year faced a stacked box at the second highest rate in the league. Now, Bijan's certainly capable of 
fighting through traffic at line of scrimmage. I think he'll do fine. But is he going to is, is he going to produce at such a high level that you're thrilled about having you know high exposure to him with that first you know with that first pick? I I just have some hesitancy. So I think I would say like I want exposure to him, but I'm not I'm not I'm certainly not going overboard where he where he's coming off the board. That makes me feel better. Let's move on, Ryan, to the second guy off the board. And we've seen his ADP really rocket after his landing spot. <clears throat> Going at pick 4-1, Jameer Gibbs, Detroit, running back, uh, uh, running back 13 behind Travis Etienne and just ahead of Najee Harris. And again, I, I wrote this article on Sunday, and I've seen Gibbs at ADP ahead of both of them. Uh, in uh, at that point, your thoughts on Najee Harris, Najee Harris, uh, your thoughts on Jameer Gibbs at that ADP. Yeah, I mean, this similar to Robinson, this feels like a fair spot where you're going to want to have some exposure. But I, I also have some concerns because, I mean, first of all, you're betting on pass game production with him, right? Like he's he's got to produce there. And the best. So in that case, you kind of you got to be a little bit worried that the Lions might be too good, right? Like, doesn't it have to be in the back of your mind if they're meeting expectations? I know some people have been talking about them as Super Bowl contenders given the weakness of the NFC this year. It, I'm, I would be a little bit worried that he's not seeing a whole lot of second-half production because, you know, if they're if they're building leads in the second half, you're not, you're not grinding it out with Jameer Gibbs. Like, he's just not that type of runner. Even at Alabama, they tried to avoid putting him in situations where he was running into a stacked box. Only 29% of his carries last year were into a stacked box. For Lions running backs, it was 70%. And that's not even a high number. That's league average that the Lions were creating in terms of stacked That's just boxes. Jamal Williams falling forward one yard for 18 touchdowns. Yeah, but like like I said, that was league average. It's not like the, the Lions are not the Falcons. They're not inviting stacked boxes at a high rate. They right. do spread defenses out. And so Gibbs, even in an offense that's, I think, going to be relatively friendly compared to the rest of the league, he's going to be facing stack boxes twice as, at least twice as often, probably more than that, as to what he was facing in Alabama because Alabama knew that they had to spread it out because he's just not that type of bulldozer type of running back. So he's not going to see a huge volume of carries in those types of games. And so like com- contrast that to, you mentioned Najah Harris coming off the board after him. Harris game script doesn't matter a ton to him, right? Like he's going to see, he's going to see passing game opportunities when they're throwing the ball. He's going to see run game opportunities when they're grinding out the clock. And so I I think that there's some better options on the board, but because the passing volume is going to create some big games for Gibbs, you certainly want exposure to him. Yeah. I wrote that. uh, I don't think this is going to be a popular take Shane, but um, you know, Despite the landing spot, he, he wasn't used, as uh, Ryan mentioned, between the tackles. He had almost no red zone usage. He wasn't even on the field a lot of times uh, with red zone. Uh, would you agree with Ryan and I that this is a tough uh, buy for you this high? Or do you think that, um, I mean, I'm, I'm a little, uh, I put a target ownership on him of 4 to 8% in my article. Uh, where Bijan, I had 8 to 12% with 8% basically being average. Your thoughts on what Ryan said and the ownership that, you know, me basically saying I'm going to be underweight at this ADP. No, I, I'm with you guys. I, I think I might even go even further. Like, I I wouldn't draft him here. I, I think I, I don't think you want to draft him here. Like, long term, I think it's going to happen. But we know David Montgomery is going to be that between the tackles running back. They paid him one of the highest paid free agent running backs here. And, and every running back is going to have something, someone to share those carries with. But uh, I, I think they're like Brian kind of said, there's, you know, there's a lot of targets, even with Jameson Williams being out, there's a lot of targets there on the Lions. They just drafted a tight end highly. Um, you know, it, you still have Amon Ross St. Brown's going to take a lot of those catches. And I, I don't think you're going to put Jameer Gibbs in the backfield. I think defenses are going to kind of know what's coming. I think it's going to take a bit to really get him involved where he's good enough to say we might run the ball up the middle when he's in the game. I think that's going to be a problematic in, in, you know, in best ball and redraft. So I would absolutely take Najee Harris over him a hundred percent of the time. I would take Kenneth Walker over him. Uh, I, I think Jameer Gibbs is going to be really hit or miss for most of this season. And I doubt we see very many, even huge games where he's getting, you know, five, six, seven catches. I just, I just don't think it's going to happen. 
Yeah, I and and uh, this is something I mentioned in the article, and it's something I've mentioned on Twitter. Um, I feel like after the draft, everyone is so excited about these rookies, and then we go to camp. Some of them are just going to plain disappoint, right? They're just not going to be as ready as we thought. Uh, uh, and then there are going to be others who get coach speak. You know, he's the backup. He has to earn it. You know, I, I think there's going to be a buying window for a lot of these rookies at lower ADPs. And that's kind of a consistent thing that we're going to see here. Um, Shane, the next guy is Jackson Smith Enigma. No, I'm sorry, Enigma. Um who uh, took a year off last year. He is the third guy off the board. He's going right around the 5-1 to Seattle. Um, I mean, I, I don't want to steal your thunder, so I'm just going to throw this to you. Um, but I will say I have not seen his ADP drop after his landing spot. Your thoughts? I think it's a little rich for me. I think it's definitely rich to to feel good about the volume coming to JSN from that slot role. I think what we what we saw here uh, ultimately from Seattle drafting is you know they're drafting a lot of offensive weapons for the future. I think JSN's not necessarily a this year type of play. It's to have those weapons in place down the line for when Tyler Lockett's gone, uh, et cetera. So I, I don't think it's this. Oh, we drafted him in the first round, so he's definitely getting on the field. Um, I think JSN's super talented. I think he's going to be a, a, a great you know, NFL wide receiver in the future. But I don't think we see that volume come this year unless we see a Tyler Lockett injury. I think I would take Tyler Lockett. Um, ahead of JSN in best ball right now. Yeah, I, I've got a target, Ryan, uh, right now of my ownership on him at this ADP at 0 to 1%. Um, going ahead of Tyler Lockett, um, he is also going ahead of um, a bunch of really good running backs. Aaron Jones, you know, he's right there with Aaron Jones and Cook and Mixon. Um, are you on board with my ownership and Shane's thoughts on uh, Jackson Smith Enigma at this uh, ADP? I'm maybe a little bit higher than the two of you on him, but I, I will say, like, I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be I'm not that enthusiastic about any of the rookies in the class at their current ADP, especially this early in the process. I mean, don't we kind of always see people are a little overexcited about drafting rookies because? you know, their new names and everybody wants to go get them on their roster. And it used to be though, a couple years ago, I'll say before Justin Jefferson went crazy, um, that there was still a significant part of the populace of drafters who, you know, where you could get, you know, you might see like a Leonard Fournette in the second round, someone, you know, who went that early. Uh, but, you know, as I went through these uh, ADPs, you know, as a uh, spoiler alert, I think almost all of them are too expensive, Ryan. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what I'm saying. These Almost all of these guys look too expensive. But that said, I'm a little higher than you guys on Smith and Jigba because I think he's such a safe prospect that he's going to come in and do what they expect of him right away. He's just such a well-rounded receiver, a guy who has you know great hands, exceptional route running, uh, surprisingly good after-catch ability for a guy who's not blazing fast. I think he's going to have a pretty smooth transition to the league, especially relative to all the other rookies. When talking about the receiver prospects, I like to use these route adjusted numbers. It basically looks at catch rate and yards after the catch, but compared to the average for each route, because obviously if you get a screen pass, that's going to have a very, very high catch rate and a lot of yards after catch right? compared to like a curl route where it's slightly lower catch rate and you know potentially no yards after the catch. So it sort of balances for your usage. And Smith and Jigbo like jumps off the charts compared to the other rookies in this class. His yards after catch above expected over the last two seasons was 34%. And his catch rate was 9% above expected of the first round receivers. Both of those were the highest rate in this class and the catch rate, especially by a good margin. So those are such safe traits as far as projecting him that I'm not concerned about him stepping in and producing right away. The only concern is just, you know, as you guys brought up, like there's there's other guys that are going to be deserving of targets. And so it's, you know, it's just going to be a matter of 
how how much are they spreading the ball around to incorporate him into the offense? Yeah, and and that was really good stuff. It helps me to get a better sense of what I want to do when he drops, and I think he has to, right? Mm-hmm. Because you know, again, going into camp, oh, he's the number four receiver, the number five receiver. You know, uh, eventually people wake up and realize Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf are both there, know the offense, uh, have a familiarity with the quarterback. The counterpoint being on JSN that he outdid two very good rookies from last year at Ohio State um, in Garrett Wilson and Michael Lave. So I, I think it's scary to be zero to one percent, but at the same time, I really do feel that 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 ADP is the worst one for me. Um, The next guy on the list uh, is going in the early seventh round. It's Jordan Addison from Minnesota. Um, Right now he is wide receiver 35 behind Mike Evans and ahead of Hollywood Brown and Traylon Burks. Ryan, your thoughts on that ADP and the player? Yeah, I think this is really aggressive for Addison. I think he's the type of player to be – to, to really be relevant. Do you think you can fantasy. get Addison's disease by drafting him this high? <laughs> I, I think you just really need, this type of player needs volume to be productive because he's not really a big play threat. He's not going to consistently stretch the field. He's not a dynamic weapon after the catch. And so he needs volume. And going into an offense where there is an absolute no doubt about it, wide receiver one that he's up against, I just don't think he's ever going to see the type of volume that he needs to really be dangerous. I mentioned those route adjusted numbers with JSN. Addison really sticks out as like the worst of the top tier receivers from this draft class. His catch rate above expected was only 3%, only 5% uh, yards yards after the catch above expected. That was by far the worst rate of the first round receivers. All, all the other guys who went in the first round um, have some decent after catch ability. And Addison just doesn't really have it. He's much more of a straight line athlete. So, uh, you know, he's he's decent. Like, I think he's going to be okay in the slot. And if he went to a different offense where the volume was going to be there, I might be much higher on him, but having to share, you know, having to share targets with Jefferson, like he's just going to get drowned out. I think. All right. Quick, just real quick. Yay. Nay. Jefferson was the un, un undisputed one, one going into, and he still is the undisputed one, one. Does Addison being there change your thoughts on him being the one one? I'm going to ask both of you just for yes or no on that. Start with you, Ryan. No, not at all. Shane? Nope. All right. So my thoughts on Addison, Shane, were um, that, you know, as a rookie where the one one player in all of football is, I think that's an aggressive ADP. He's going ahead of Hollywood Brown, Traylon Burks, and Darren Waller. So I'll mix him in only when he falls. Um, I've got him at three to five percent projected ownership for me. Um, your thoughts on that? What Ryan said, and I mean, honestly, I just didn't like the kid's demeanor at the draft either. I know that's silly, uh, but he was acting like he was Antonio Brown a little bit, and I don't think he has that kind of skill set. Um, and I found guys who have the big attitude but not the big ability often just don't do all that well. But I know that I'm in the minority here. Your thoughts, Shane? Well, I, I, I kind of disagree with you guys. I don't – I agree like this right here is aggressive. Like I would much rather have Traylon Burks. I'd much rather have Hollywood Brown. You know, I probably don't take Addison often in the seventh round. Um, but I, I do think there could be an opportunity for volume there when, you know, we started to see late last year, safeties roll over to Justin Jefferson's side. We saw the Vikings kind of get shut down in a lot of ways in some games. I think that's why they went out and got Addison. I think the route running is so good. He gets open. Uh, I I think we could see some spike games. I think you're going to have some two catch seven, you know, for seven yard games it tossed in there. But I I think a best ball, I'm more willing to spend it on him because I think there's going to be some games where teams just sell out for Jefferson and we see maybe more Addison, more Hawkinson, uh, especially because I don't think Minnesota's running the ball as much as they usually do. I, I think it's going to be a full-on press passing game this season. I think Addison could benefit. So still a little high for me, but 
but I do think he has an opportunity. I think he's a better wide receiver than he gets credit for. Um, the fact that he's not the super athlete, but still went as high as he did usually means good things uh, that he's that talented. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little more in than you two. Yeah. Well, I, I did have him at three to 5% because of a lot of the things that you said. And so uh, as he drops a little more, um, I think I will be a little more interested. Next guy up is Anthony Richardson, who is going early eighth round. He's starting to go uh, right around where Dak and um, he, when I wrote this, it was Dak and Tua and his rocket ship has taken him to now he's in between Watson and Dak uh, in ADP. Um, Shane, your thoughts on Anthony Richardson at that ADP? I, I think it's pretty preposterous. Like, I understand the upside. I, I get it. If he starts all year, like, he can definitely hit this ADP with the rushing ability and the size. But I don't think we know how many games he starts. I think Gardner Minshew is likely to start the season despite being the fourth overall pick. I think it's just, like, very aggressive for Anthony Richardson to take him over Tua with Tyreek Hill and Jalen Waddell and, and the upside he brings to the table. I, I can't justify – taking Anthony Richardson uh, anywhere close to here, even with that upside. Uh, Ryan, I wrote that I like Richardson and I was hoping to take a lot to him, but this is very aggressive. Um, you know, Shane brings up what a lot of people think that Gardner Minshew is going to start the first few games. I don't think that. I think Richardson is going to be on the field day one. I think, you know, he's just, good, you know, he's too talented uh, not to be, but even there, I think he's going to struggle year one. And I don't think he's a, as much of a natural runner as some of the other guys who we've seen be Konami code uh, quarterbacks. What do you think about what I just said, Shane just said, and the ADP of one Anthony Richardson? Yeah, I mean, this is tough because I certainly don't want to draft him at this spot. It's so aggressive. But at the same time, the ceiling is so high that I feel like I would, if his ADP stays here, I feel like I would have to sprinkle him in a little bit just because right. I don't want to completely miss out. So I, I do think you have to like pick your spots and take him here occasionally. But yeah, it's, it's crazy. I mean, even going back to two years ago in 2021, Jalen Hurts was QB nine in fantasy among the quarterback. So, you know, and that was Hurts much, much further along in his overall development than Richardson is right now. And he, he even then it wasn't lighting it up. And, and Hurts is a more natural runner, I think. Yeah, it's certainly a more physical runner, I guess you could say. I mean, I think Richardson development wise is where Hurts was in 2016 when he was at, at his first year at Alabama when he was clearly a bad passer, just purely a runner. And like, yeah, Hertz eventually turned it around and maybe Richardson can too, but a lot of time passed in between uh, that, that initial look we had at Hertz and the Super Bowl quarterback. So yeah, this is, it's really aggressive, but you'd have to just, you'd have to do it occasionally, I think. Yeah, I agree. I've got him in the six to 9% range um, where I, 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 you know, again, he's moved up again since I did this. I would say six to eight now. I, I want to be slightly under. One one little tip that I will give people, and this is a shout out to uh, Justin Herzig. I think if you draft Richardson, the tendency is going to be to want to take a third quarterback. I think you have to resist that urge. I think that if you're taking him at this ADP, you're in that team, you're guessing that you're right. And so um, don't, hedge your bet on those teams your hedge on Richardson is all the teams that you don't take him uh Ryan the next guy on the board is Quinton Johnson and Quinton Johnson was I would say pretty safe to say the most polarizing guy um out of the the rookies this year um he he has later first round draft capital going behind Dotson and Sutton um, at wide receiver 43, your thoughts on Quentin Johnson? Yeah, well, if, if he's the most polarizing, I'm at the very low end of the spectrum. I, I, If he stays at this ADP, I'll be fine to have zero shares of Quentin Johnson. I want no part of him. He's just such a difficult player to figure out. 
And with other receivers there, I think even the upside isn't that high, but the floor is like the floor is nothing. Like he might do nothing for them if he struggles to fit into that offense. He's a big body wide receiver who has bad hands and all of his production came after the catch in the air raid offense that he plays in. So he's transitioning to Kellen Moore's offense, a much different offense. And his progression at TCU also, which gives me concern as he's transitioning to new offense, was very slow. I mean, he was a, a big time recruit, high expectations. And honestly, like a year ago at this time, it was kind of like we didn't know what to expect despite the high expectations. He was far from a first round lock at this time a year ago. It took him a long time to ascend to that level. Who was so- that West Virginia wide receiver who, who did that, came on really strong? And he never uh, did anything. Kevin Kevin White. Kevin maybe? White. In, injuries yeah. certainly got in the way of him, but yeah, he was another guy who came on late. So I I want no part of him at this age. Like he would have to drop multiple rounds for me to even consider drafting him because I think the floor is just you know, it, like the floor is like ten to fifteen catches on the season for him. I think. Wow. Um, all right. Well, I'm a little more positive on him. I have a target of three to five percent, but in my notes, Shane. I said, really, I'm only looking to take him when I have Justin Herbert, and I, you know, Herbert goes before him, so I know. And then you're 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 betting and hoping that you build a good enough team to get to the playoffs, and maybe there's an injury down there. Uh, my biggest thing was Quentin Johnson was he 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 you know at times he just looked amazing, and at times he just looked lost. But he he to me he's a big guy who plays like a small guy. And I think that, you know, if he ever figures out how to play like a big guy, he could be good. Uh, but your thoughts on the ADP and what Ryan had to say. Well, I, I don't think Ryan's wrong about the floor. Like, I think the floor is absolute zero for Quinn Johnston this year. You know, he's at best the wide receiver for to start the season. There's no way to get past that. I mean, we have seen Keenan Allen and Mike Williams consistently getting hurt these past couple years for anyone that's owned them in fantasy knows that pretty well. Um, my Mike big Williams? question. No, nah. no, nah, never. My, no. You know, my big question is, uh, you know, with what both of you talked about is Kellen Moore in this offense going to actually scheme Quentin Johnston to do what he did well. <laughs> like if they do that, if they get the ball to him behind the line, let him do those things after the catch, you know, don't force him into this role in this offense that he doesn't fit into then I think there is some potential, like you said, Todd, if, if there's an injury that, that Quentin Johnston could have some explosive games late or in the playoffs, uh, fantasy playoffs or, you know, late in the year. So uh, I, I think I think it's a little bit rich once again, like all these rookies. But, uh, you know, I, I would definitely want to sprinkle them in a bit for that potential upside. Yeah, I, uh, I uh, you know, Ryan being so down on him has adjusted my view. Um, I thought it was pretty aggressive. Um, all right, let's move on, Chain, to the next guy. It's uh, right in the middle of the ninth round for Zach Charbonnet. Um, running back 31 uh, behind Kamara and ahead of A.J. Dillon. There's some other good running backs there as well. Um, your thoughts? I mean, I see on Twitter, Shane, a lot of people saying, that Walker's ADP is wrong and Charbonnet's not going high enough. Um, Your thoughts? I I like Zach Charbonnet. I liked him as a prospect. He was my RB4 in the class. I think he has a little bit of that power. And like Ryan mentioned earlier, he he has some big three. uh, Devin Achain, which maybe we'll get to here. I I had Achain and uh, Charbonneau tied. As yeah. my, you know, kind of depending on what you needed, I had them pretty even. I was just curious. Go ahead. No, but but I think what Ryan said before the big playability is there with Charbonnet. Uh, I, but I disagree with. Uh, I think the general Twitter consensus. I think it's a little bit new, shiny, toyish to say. Well, Ken Walker's going to be, you know, he's going to be the guy that's going to win. I mean, he was super effective and efficient in that offense last year. Similar to what we talked about with JSN. I don't think Kenneth Walker knowing the offense, knowing how the system works is just going to fade to the background for Charbonnet. It seems like they drafted Charbonnet to have a little bit more of the pass catching skill, potential big play threat. Um, This feels high to me with a lot of question marks, even with the upside. Uh, I I think, uh, you know, I think I would take the shot on Dylan or Madison over Charbonnet here. Uh, Ryan, uh, my, my thought was this. 
I wasn't drafting Walker in the second round all that much in early best ball because I knew Pete Carroll had this in him, right? He just showed it last mm-hmm. year when they drafted Walker. I think, you know, again, I'm not the tape watcher you guys are, but I, I've done pretty good with running backs. And I liked Walker's tape a lot more than Charbonnet. I, I, I like Charbonnet, but to me, Walker was just a different level. Um, we've already seen both with Penny being drafted a few years ago, uh, and Chris Carson had kind of a 1A to a 1B. And then last year before Penny got hurt, he was the 1A to Walker's 1B. Um, am I wrong in thinking that Charbonnet is the, or Charbonneau is the 1B and that um, he's going to need to really outperform a guy I'm not sure he can outperform to get um, a 50-50 or better split? Well, I might be a little higher on you guys than Charbonnet because I, th- I think the ceiling is pretty high here. And I'm this is sort of just like reading between the lines and looking comparing these two running backs and trying to guess what might be in Pete Carroll's head. But I have a hunch that part of the reason why he made this pick was he might be like quietly frustrated with Kenneth Walker because Carroll is now one of like the old school coaches in the league, right? Like they're a little bit more conservative than most teams. And he's kind of been passed yeah. by although he opened up the offense a little, a little. bit more <laughs> a, a, a little I'm a little kidding. yeah and so for those on radio i just put my hands very far apart <laughs> yeah i i have a hunch that although kath walker had some good games he's probably frustrated with how often how boomer bust kenneth walker is especially when he's he's not the type of runner who gets contacted who, who fights through contact at the line of scrimmage he dances a lot and tries to hit a home run on every play. And I just wanted to read this from my scouting report on Kenneth Walker because I think it totally came true. And then I'll share a stat to prove it. I wrote constantly going off script with some huge home runs and a ton of, pl- but a ton of plays stopped dead in the backfield. You'll have to live with him doing his own thing and hope the good outweighs the bad. Now, in year one in Seattle, Walker, when he was contacted at or behind the line of scrimmage, he was stopped for zero or negative yards on 51% of those carries. That was the third worst rate in the league 50 because he's not hitting the hole hard he's dancing he's dancing in the backfield so as soon as somebody's in the backfield with him he goes down and that's gotta frustrate pete carroll he's too often You're he's running the ball right on first down and he's finding himself in second and 10 or second and 12 now charbonnet complete opposite when he was contacted at or behind the line of scrimmage at ucla last year only 35 percent of the time did he actually get tackled in the backfield that was the 15th <laughs> lowest rate in FBS. And I went back to sort of get more of an apples to apples comparison. Walker in his final year at Michigan State, he had the exact same rate as he did as a rookie. 51% of those carries were stopped dead in the backfield. He's a he's a dancer. He's trying to hit home runs. And even though he does it sometimes, and so he has some good games, that's got to frustrate Pete Carroll, right? Like knowing that he's an old school coach. So I'm kind of wondering if maybe this pick specifically getting one of those guys who's good at just like plowing through that traffic at the line of scrimmage if carol thought you know what i would just feel a lot more comfortable with that kind of guy leading our backfield so i think the possibility of charbonnet being the 1a in this backfield is out there if i'm sort of piecing this together and connecting the dots correctly as far as carol's thinking interesting shane i'm going to give you a chance to uh to uh comment on this before we move on well, I, I just he drafted Kenneth Walker too, knowing what you know as well. <laughs> you know, you know, like it, it, like that. I don't think that was hidden, like you mentioned from Kenneth Walker's college game. So I, I think there is a complementary piece to both of these, right? And for fantasy, it sucks. I, I think it sucks as a whole. I think it means probably both of them we're not going to have that consistency game to game. If, if if Walker's running hot, making the big plays. He's probably the guy, and if they need that that short yardage consistency, then maybe Charbonnet is the guy. Um, and you and you have the three receivers. I think it's just going to be so much going around in this Seahawks offense. It's going to be tough to rely on may, maybe anyone at this point. Yeah, my takeaway is I still think we're going to get a better buying opportunity on Charbonnet because we're going to get that, you know, that period where you know in camp Walker's the one A. You know, they're not just going to give it to him, right? And so, you know, we're going to see Walker at the 1A to start camp most likely. I, so I think there's going to be a buying opportunity on Charbonnet. But Ryan did talk me into taking a little bit more to hedge my bet here 
because there's no guarantee of that. And I don't want to completely avoid a guy who could be good. And Walker could get hurt, right? Um, yeah, so um, that's, that's my big takeaway from talking about him. Ryan, the next guy up is uh, Devin A. Chain. Uh, Shane and I just mentioned him, third round pick. Running back 36 behind Penny and um, just in front of two other running backs that I happen to like this year in Harris of the Bills and P. Ryan of the Broncos going in uh, the middle of the 10th round. Um, your thoughts on Devin A. Chain? Yeah, I'm staying far away at this ADP. For a tiny running back like that, you just I don't think we can expect much of a much of a run game volume at all, especially thinking about him in this offense. Like think about the McDaniel Shanahan offense and the running backs we've seen. The majority of the guys that have really excelled there have been bigger guys. And so I, I think my guess is that the selection of A Chain was really all about his pass game. And McDaniel just sort of wanted like a a fun gimmick tool to play with. And I, I think that's all he's going to be in the offense because obviously they've got plenty of pass game weapons already. So he's not going to be featured heavily in the pass game. I think he's just going to be coming into the field, onto the field occasionally for some gimmick type plays. And they're going to manufacture a few touches for him, but I just don't see any path to him having the type of volume that he would need to justify this ADP. See, I'm, I'm going to disagree here. Um, and of course, with respect, um, I, I see a guy and I don't watch tape. Maybe I, I watched four games and I saw a guy, even though he's small, who didn't run small. Right. I saw a guy who, who, who seemed to be able to run um, like a normal back, even though he was small. Um, I, I think he's going to be kind of lightning in the bottle um, where they do give him carries. And if he gets stuffed for minus one and minus one, I don't think Mike McDaniels is going to care because he's going to know that the third carry, he could go 80 yards, right? With the speed that they've got everywhere else. So um, Shane, that's, you know, I have a buy window of 10 to 15% for myself. Uh, Ryan not being on board, definitely something I'm going to consider. Uh, what are your thoughts? I, I like Devin A. Chain. Uh, I do. I think it would have been, I'd feel a lot better if you got round two capital. And then, and I think I'd feel better about that path to being the RB one in the offense sooner. Like I think Ryan's point is bet that they have two other guys that work in the system and Raheem Mostert and Jeff Wilson. Uh, if those guys can stay healthy, but I I'm with you, Todd. I think Devin A chain runs, runs bigger and is decisive. He ha kind of has that one cut zone blocking ability to be decisive, see the hole and hit the hole. And I think that's, more the skill set that's needed when it's the coach's guy, right? Because the coach is the one who's going to decide if you get to see the field. And we know from the reports that Devin A. Chain was Mike McDaniel's guy. So uh, I'm, yeah, I, I think I'm in, you know, I obviously would like some P. Ryan, like some Damian Harris, Rashad Penny at this level too. Like, I think those are all good Absolutely. backs to take, but I think, uh, I think you got to have, I think got to have some A. Chain because I think the upside is really, really high for him. All right, Ryan, I'm going to give you a chance this time to uh, sum us up on Devin A. Chain uh, based on everything. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with some of what you're saying in terms of like the big playability. I just I still question whether the volume is going to be there. Like, I, I don't think that there's going to be enough spikes. We could certainly have him have a game where he has like, you know, five carries for 40 yards and a touchdown and, you know, two catches for. 60 yards and a touchdown like that that could happen once or twice but I don't think there's gonna I just don't think there's gonna be enough volume for him just just because of the other pass catchers really like we know that's really what he's there to do is contribute in the passing game and they've got they've got plenty of other big time options too all right up next is in the early 11th round let's get kinky Shane Dalton Kincaid uh Buffalo late first round pick tight end 11 ahead of Schultz and Komet your thoughts on Mr. Kincaid, um, you know, a lot of talk on Twitter about him being a slot receiver, not a tight end. So you can avoid the whole thought that tight ends take time to get going. Your thoughts. I, I love Dalton Kincaid for a dynasty. I don't love Dalton Kincaid for retraft. Like I'm drafting a ton of them in my rookie drafts, but 
Uh, I, I don't care if you're a slot receiver. Like tight ends still take a while to get going. I think Dalton Kincaid will be the same. Dawson Knox isn't going to turn completely into a pumpkin either. Um you know, Although I like taking. Does a... kind of look like one if you really. Uh, no, sometimes, kidding. sometimes, maybe a, a little uh, orange there, but uh, you know, I, I like taking rookie tight ends at, at the end of the draft, taking a shot on guys there when when it doesn't cost this much. Um, I think Kincaid's going to take a little bit of time to get acclimated, like everything. I think he could have a couple good weeks late, but uh, this is too expensive for me over over Dalton Schultz or, or Cole Komet. Yeah, Ryan, uh, I mean, I like Dalton Kincaid a lot also. Great hands, good route runner. I, I, I don't remember exactly what Matt Waldman was picking on on one of his posts, but um, he does have some work to do. Um, your thoughts on Dalton Kincaid here? Yeah, I mean, I, I would just echo everything that Shane said. I, I like him long term, but I just don't see enough volume for him. The the thought that he's like more of a slot receiver than a tight end, I don't necessarily buy that because we've seen Buffalo continue to it. We've seen this front office and this coaching staff there for long enough to know what they look for in slot receivers, right? And it doesn't look anything like Dalton Kincaid. They like smaller, quicker guys. They had Cole Beasley. They drafted Cleo and Shakir. And Shakir looked Shakir pretty good. Year. Yeah, a lot of people were excited about Shakir when they drafted him there. That was a good landing spot for him. There were also rumors before leading up to this draft that they were linked to Josh Downs, who I th- it was a very similar receiver to Khalil Shakir. So I, I think we have a pretty good idea of what their slot receiver looks like. And it's certainly not Kincaid. And so he's, even if he, he's going to line up in the slot sometimes, of course, but he's, he's going to be competing with Knox for targets. And I, I just don't, I, I don't, I don't see how a rookie tight end with blocking deficiencies with a good tight end ahead of him on a depth chart is going to have enough volume to justify where he's coming off the board. All right. In an attempt to get as many guys uh, out of the top 25 done, I'm going to do the next one, Ryan, as a threesome um, of guys all going in the uh, early to mid 12th round. Uh, Jalen Hyatt to the Giants, third round pick. Jonathan Mingo to the uh, Panthers, second round pick. And Rashi Rice, Kansas City, second round pick. All of them are c- coming off the board very, very close to each other. Um, any favorites, anyone that you like here um, more than another? Uh, give me your breakdown of these three guys at this ADP. Yeah, Mingo jumps out to me as a clear favorite among this this grouping here. I love what he does after the catch. He's a running back with the ball in his hands. And so I think, especially working with a young quarterback in Carolina, this is a good spot for him to potentially get peppered with targets, even pretty early in his career. I know there's some veterans there, but you know, especially later in the season, once they've probably been eliminated, it would certainly make sense to get him pretty heavily involved. And because he is pretty good at getting open on shorter routes and producing after the catch, there could be good volume for him. I mentioned the route adjusted numbers before his route adjusted yards after the catch was 19% above expected. Now he's not nearly as fast as Jalen Hyatt, but significantly better in this metric Hyatt's yards after the catch above expected was only 13%, which is, you know, decent as you expect for a guy with speed, but not great because he's really much more of a straight line athlete. Whereas Mingo yeah, he's so much more physical. And, you know, like I said, he's kind of a, a running back with the ball in his hand. So I think it's a really, a really great fit for him there to potentially get good volume. And I just, I just like his skill set. Interesting. And um, Rashi, right? Um, uh, Rice. I have questions about him. I, I like his talent long term. I have questions about how he's going to fit in right away because. He's just kind of a sloppy player. I don't really see a guy who has super precise routes. His hands are kind of inconsistent. And so I question how quickly he's going to get on the same page as Mahomes. I mean, we saw Sky Moore last year as a rookie struggle to really carve out a role for himself, even in a not super talented receiving core. And I think Moore was more polished as a prospect than Rice is. So another guy that like dynasty wise, I, I certainly like him in sort of the range where he's coming off the board in dynasty, but as, as far as rookie year expectations, I'm not really high on Rice. Yeah, and I could see him getting steamed kind of like Sky Moore did last year. You know, I saw someone already posting him catching a, a down and out in shorts about eight yards and, you know, pumping him up. Um, and uh, that, that caused me to make a tweet about um, 
you know, okay, the draft's over. We're now getting guys in shorts, getting pumped up season. Uh, Shane, I like Hyatt a lot here. Um, I get the Mingo thing, and I like Hyatt because the big knock on Hyatt is that he was schemed up in college. But meanwhile, Brian Dable won Coach of the Year because of how he was able to scheme up. Um, and I think they, you know, Hyatt has that kind of home run ability you want in your later wide receiver, you know, your fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth wide receiver. Um, your thoughts on the three guys and how you have them? I, I'm actually like super similar to Ryan here. Uh, I, I, to me, it'd be like, 50-50, Mingo, Hyatt. G give me both those guys. I would just draft a bunch of both. Uh, I'm with you, Todd. I think Hyatt has that ability, obviously, to get deep uh, and, and, and win. And I think that they'll scheme up some ways to do that. I'm intrigued to see how they utilize them in that offense. But uh, I think Jonathan Mingo's upside in the Frank Reich offense is even more. I mean, Frank Reich loves his ex-receiver. We saw Michael Pittman as a rookie getting 90, 80 to 90% of snaps immediately. Uh, I think by game two, he is getting 90% of snaps at that X spot. I mean, that is, that is the spot that runs this offense in the wide receiver group and you don't have many options there. So I, I think Mingo has the upside as well. Uh, I, I'd probably be taking both those guys. And I agree about Rasheed Rice. I think he's going to take a bit to get up to speed more of a long-term than short-term uh, buy here. All right, let's, uh, let's do the quarterbacks quick. Um, because they're they're pretty much up next. Um, I'm gonna just make a statement, and you guys can either agree or disagree, and then throw in one quick thought for each of them. In general, I don't like drafting rookie quarterbacks on bad offenses, um, even late too much, uh, unless they can run. And neither of these guys run. I I, I think they're fine to mix in. Uh, but I am not really, um, as a high volume drafter, you know, I'm looking to be done with my top two quarterbacks by this point. And occasionally, if I'm not, and I know I need to take three, I probably will take Stroud over uh, Young. Your thoughts, Shane, and then we're going to go right over to Ryan. Uh, I, I'm the opposite. I, I, I like Young. I think he's got to run. I think he's going to be this offense. So I, I would take him here. Ryan? I, I kind of like both these guys at their ADP, but I, I'm with you, Todd. I slight, I slightly, pre given the gap in their ADP, I slightly prefer Stroud because I, the one thing I'll disagree with you on is I actually think Stroud is going to run a little bit. I think this offense, I think he's seen, more likely to run. Yeah, we've seen them incorporate it, and you know he's he certainly was capable. Of it. I think Ohio State was very cautious with how they used him, even during his career when asked about his lack of run game he often said like I don't, I don't call the plays like the coaches were tr were trying to uh limit his exposure to hits so i could see his run game volume pick up quite a bit yeah and i'll throw in one other kind of sneaky thing i thought of here carolina has a much better defense than houston and when you, you know what you know with rookie you you want you know because the tendency is to not throw too much at them too soon when they really get to air it out is when they're behind and I think a sneaky um, thing for Stroud is that the, the Texans are a worse uh, defense uh, and they might be playing from behind more. Shane? No, I think that is a good point uh, defensively and what, what could happen. But I think both these teams could get scored on. Uh, I, I think Bryce Young is cerebral enough to really get the offense very quickly. Um once again, I, I I think both these these guys could run a bit and make for some big games in best ball. Uh, I, I wouldn't want to miss miss out on that compared to some of the quarterbacks going ahead of them. Fair enough, fair enough. Um, you know, I, I I tend to well. All right, let's not spend too much time on quarterbacks. Uh, let's move over to the two tight ends that go in this area. Uh, Michael Mayer, uh, fourteen one, good landing spot. Um, Laporta, uh, fifteen six, so a, a full a, like a round and a half later uh, to Detroit. Uh, you mentioned Shane that you don't like taking them that early. Um, rookie tight ends. Uh, wh what are your thoughts on these two guys? 
I, I think I'd take a stab on each. I mean, I, I don't think that either one is guaranteed like instant playing time starter, you know, playing 85% of the snaps type of deal. Uh, but I think both might be brought along a little bit slowly. So I might rather take, a you know, Mike Gasicki over Sam Laporta or an Irv Smith over Michael Mayer. Um, so I'm probably out uh, on, on both these at these ADPs. Ryan? Yeah, I'm, I'm mostly in agreement with Shay on this. I, I don't like Meyer partially because there's obviously competition there with Hooper. And um, over the last five seasons, the, the three lowest rates of 12 personnel usage were all Josh McDaniels, including last year at the Raiders. It's not really a, getting two tight ends on the field is not really a feature of his offense, which means that he and Hooper are going to be sharing opportunities. I also think with him not really being a dynamic athlete, He's in terms of fantasy, he's probably going to become a guy who's more touchdown dependent than some other tight ends. And, you know, who I, I don't we don't really know what that offense is going to be. It certainly wasn't encouraging signs last year with Carr there. And who knows if it really improves Laporta. I'm a little more interested in. I think he's a pretty, pretty good athlete. His route adjusted yards after the catch was 21 percent above expected, which is very good for a tight end. So if he gets opportunities, you know, maybe he carves out a role for himself there, but he's another rookie tight end with some deficiencies in his blocking. And those guys historically struggle to get on the field. And I would think that's going to continue to be the case for a, a team like the lions that really prides itself on its physicality. Yeah. And, and they're a team that couldn't find a, a, a way to get uh Hawkinson the ball for a couple of years, but um, I know that Laporte is a little bit different of a player. Shane had mentioned that to me in one of our private chats. All right. Uh, we got time to quickly hit uh, the next tier of running backs and the next tier of wide receivers. Um, let's just go with uh, who your favorite is. Is there anyone you love? Um, it's Chase Brown, uh, Tank Bigsby, Tajay Spears, and Zach Evans. Uh, I think it's your turn, Ryan. Well, factoring in the ADP for those guys, I think I would go with Zach Evans. Uh, it looks like he's coming off the board the end of the 17th round. So, you know, you're, you're potentially spending your last pick on him. And there's a little bit of upside, obviously, with um, Akers having injury concerns. And I think he's a much more dynamic athlete than Kyron Williams. So I think it's pretty reasonable to expect him to win that backup job. And, you know, if an injury happens, there's some upside there. So as a very late dart throw, I, I think there's enough upside to be interested in Evans. Shane? I, I think I'd go Tank Bigsby. I, I think he can win that backup job being a, a, a top 100 pick. And you have – I think they want someone behind ETN to get some of the short yardage stuff. And I think Bigsby is the most talented of these running backs as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm in on him in the 15th. Yeah, I like Bigsby. I think he's going to have a good floor there. I think they clearly – don't want Travis Etienne to, you know, you know. So I don't know what happened with James Robinson, where they were running him and then they stopped running him. But I think deep down they want Etienne to kind of be in the powered range of touches. Uh, my guy is Tajay Spears. I think he landed in the nut spot. I think he, you know, what one thing I've learned with running backs is I like looking for certain characteristics that a, a running back have that are that's elite you know jameer gibbs receiving in his burst i think tajay spears is an elite athlete at being able to avoid tackles and he, he's just electric and i feel like because of his knee it news um he's dropping but that knee injury is a concern if you're a dynasty owner not a best ball owner ryan um do you want to try and damper my love? Oh, and I also love the landing spot. I think they're going to mix him in Tennessee. And then if Henry gets hurt, I think he's going to be the guy. So, you know, you got a, an electric guy who's going to get on the field because he's electric as a change of pace back. And then you've got a, what, Derrick Henry's 40 now. Um, I, I think if, if Derrick Henry does finally break down, Ryan uh, Spears is going to be the dude. Yeah, I mean, totally agree with your assessment of him probably having a little more value in uh, best ball this year than his dynasty value because of the injury concerns long term, which sound pretty serious. I would push back a little bit on what you're saying about the the value as the backup because they did just spend similar draft capital last year in Hassan Haskins, who is a much better fit if you're trying to replicate what Derrick Henry does. 
So assuming they haven't just totally soured on Haskins, I, I would be surprised if Spears is just automatically getting plugged in as a backup because Haskins could step in and you wouldn't really have to change much. He, he really fits that mold really well. All right, fair enough. All right, let's do the wide receiver, Shane. The last couple guys, uh, Marvin Mims, Jaden Reed, Tank Dell, and Josh Downs. Um, anyone, any of those you love and any of those you're just fading? Can I, can I take none? Can I stop take any of those <laughs> receivers? I, I think a lot of them long-term I, I like a little bit more. I guess if I'm forced into it at the ADP, I'll take Tank Dell for Houston just because the opportunity seems to be there. You know, he is explosive off the line, and maybe they can kind of scheme up some of that, uh, you know, 49ers offense, Debo Samuel, get you know, get him the ball behind the line and see what he can do, but – I, I I just don't I don't think Jaden Reed's ready to step into a slot role immediately with with two tight ends getting drafted uh, with similar capital. I don't think we see much of Marvin Mims unless there's an injury. I, I don't think Josh Downs. I think he's going to take some time. I don't know about that fit immediately. I think these are long term receivers that uh, I wouldn't draft and redraft. I, I I like Mims and I like Downs. I like taking shots on them. Um, so I, I, I'll I'll throw that out there with a caveat that I'm not nearly good at, as evaluating wide receivers as I am running backs. Uh, Ryan, we're going to let you finish up here. Yeah, the guy I'm fading is Reed. He was my 20th ranked receiver in this class. So by my board, the Packers made a huge reach. I just think he's kind of an ordinary athlete, average size. His hands are super inconsistent. So I just don't see a. But huge other than that, do you like him? <laughs> yeah, I mean, using those route adjusted numbers, it shows how ordinary he can be. His catch rate was two percent above expected. His yak was 0.4 percent below expected. So he's just sort of like even in college, just sort of an average kind of guy. Um, so I'm, I'm definitely fading him. I don't. Maybe he develops into something there, but especially working with a young quarterback, that's a bad spot for him. And I'm with you on Mims. I'm I'm excited about Mims. Obviously, he's clearly got two guys ahead of him, but there have been one trade and a half. Yeah. I think Sutton yeah. is, you know, we're getting to the point with Sutton where there's no Sutton movements. You know, I, I, I see a slow guy. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to like him. I keep kept wanting to like him. I think Judy's the clear 1A there. And I wouldn't be shocked if Mims kind of uh, plays the Brandon Cooks role. Um, mm -hmm. And who was the guy that they used in New Orleans before Brandon Cooks all the way back, Shane? Um, that home run hitter. Anyway, it uh, doesn't matter. Devery Henderson? Do we have, is that, yes, uh, Dev, that Devery Henderson. Know. Right. You know, so there is a history. Uh, you know, one of the great things when, you, when you're looking to model what might happen in the future is to look at these coaches past. And, um, yeah, I like Mims. Um, I want to like Tank Dell. But I think he's a little, you know, there's plays he makes where he gets himself so wide open that you're like, oh, my gosh, that's exactly what I want. And then I see other plays, Ryan, where he makes a move and the guy's still, you know, even though he's small and supposedly explosive, the guy's still there. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think he's a super fun weapon. He's going to have some highlight real plays. He may even have a couple of games where he has like, four catches for 120 yards and a touchdown. Like he Which could is have... all you need at this ADP. Yeah. So I, I think the fact that he's coming off the board in the last round, that's fine. Like I, I would, I would certainly sprinkle him in there as a last round flyer. My biggest concern with the landing spot is that he's probably a slot only guy because of, at that size, and he's got to contend for slot opportunities with Robert Woods, John Mechie and Xavier Hutchinson, who they drafted after him. So I he'll have they're a... going to play him outside. I, I I've read Dell? that. Like... Yeah, I, I and I, I don't get it, but I... Well, I think they're going to change their mind on that pretty soon when they see him take some hits. Yeah. Well, I, 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 um, I, I want to say thank you to both of you guys. Uh, we're, hit, we're heading on the hour mark, and I normally try and get us in at 50 minutes. Um, I, I want to thank both of you. This was amazing information. Um, I think we absolutely need to do this again later, uh, you know, once we get into camp. I would love to have you both back. Um, I want to thank you both. Um, and uh, we will see you guys next week. Thank you for uh, spending some time with Ryan, Shane, and myself. Have a good day.